Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Merry Christmas. Hey, we can get excited about that, can't we? What a great day. Awesome. Well, hey, it's glad to see all of you here. Um, I hope that you're all uh, sugared up already and, and ready to do some worship this morning. Um, we'll get into some announcements uh, as we get started here today. Uh, first of all, Merry Christmas. We kind of already said that, but uh, what an awesome day. And thank you if you're here last night. What a great service last night. So thank you to everybody that was a part of that. Um, also, uh, if you still want to take a family picture or take some pictures out there, we have uh, Jody Taylor and Mike did help. Uh, put up a, a nice little deal out there. I, we were working on it out there. We kind of knocked it down a little bit, so we're tacking it back up. But uh, if you want to take a picture, please go out and do that and ask one of us to take it for you. Don't be shy. Um, in January, uh, as, um, as you know, we'll start our, our grief support group again, our grief share. Um, that will start on January 15th uh, up in room 201. Um, if you've lost somebody or still dealing with a loss, uh, please do get a hold of me or Karen Glenn. Um, and, uh, and get a, be, be a part of that. We did the Surviving the Holidays a couple weeks ago, and uh, so a great ministry, and, uh, and we look forward to talking to you if you want to be interested in that. Also, we are uh, we're working the concession stand for the JV basketball tournament on December 29th, our church is, at the high school. Uh, so there's a sign-up for a couple shifts there if you would love to, to come and help us work the concession stand. Uh, we'd really appreciate that, so get signed up. We'll donate the money back to the school somewhere. Um, also, Embrace Grace. They have a new semester starting January 9th. If you're not familiar with that ministry, uh, Ashley Katz and Megan Keyswater uh, help uh, mo mothers that are dealing with unexpected pregnancies um, and give them support. Um, so they have a semester starting, and they have uh, four mothers uh, this semester already, so that's awesome. Uh, and they'll be having a double baby shower twice. <laughs> the first double baby shower uh, is going to be Man, I cannot read that this morning. On Sunday, January 22nd at 1.30 at The Rock. Um, so you can see on there, uh, there's diapers and wipe shower for uh, one of the mamas. And also one, uh, Lacey is expecting a baby boy. So uh, get with them uh, on that baby shower and please uh, support that ministry. Also, uh, we have Right Now Media. If you uh, uh, have not heard of that, we offer it to you for free. It's got a lot of awesome uh, Bible studies and kids programming uh, on there. So let us know. We'll send you an email invite. We'd be glad to sign up for that. The offices will be closed uh, tomorrow uh, on Monday and on January 2nd. Uh, after next Sunday is January 1st. So it'll be closed both those days. Um, also, uh, just so you know, next Sunday uh, we will have both services on New Year's Day, but we will not have Sunday school. So just a reminder on that. Um, we uh, will get into the scripture reading first today, so if you please stand with me for the reading of God's word. We'll be in Isaiah today, in chapter 9, starting in verse 6. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, His government and His peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of His ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heavenly armies will make this happen. Good morning. Dana loves today. She planned it, and then she got sick, so she's home. This is for her, but it's more for our Lord. I hope you guys had a great time last night with your families, enjoying each other. But if you would now please shake each other's hand and say, Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas!
So if you guys would start gathering back, get ready to sing some four-part harmony out there. Sopranos, Nija, altos, basses, and tenors.
Good morning and Merry Christmas. Well, there's a lot of benefits growing up in a rural community and kind of and growing up on the farm or raising your family on a farm that being out in the fresh outdoors, not having your neighbor's dog wake you up at 530 in the morning. There, there's a lot of different benefits from that. But being having livestock to take care of the last few weeks for many people, as you just know, with the weather, it's kind of been a challenge. What we've been doing, we've been uh, taking a lot of extra hay out to give them a little extra energy to help keep them warm. And then we've been, certain places, laying out some straw for some bedding. Now that's two smells from the country that I actually really enjoy. Alfalfa and wheat straw. I don't know why, but it's just something I always enjoy. And when we, um, during cabin season, we'll go and we'll lay out straw in the pens for the, the mama cows to come in and, and have their babies. And after it's all laid out there, it's, it's a great smell and a great aroma. But then after a few hours or a few days, that smell starts to change. But I remember being in there one time and just thinking, you know, I wonder if this calving stable would be similar to maybe the stable that Jesus was born in. And I just kind of thought for a second, it kind of humbled me, and I was like, you know, we don't know exactly the full descriptions of it, but we know there are livestock in the area. So I was like, maybe it could work. So I said, maybe my calving stable would have been a place that Jesus could have been born. It helps me realize that, you know, God is not aloof. He's not out of touch with our situation. He's not, he's not saying, sorry, you and your life have to be too disgusting for me. I'm just going to stay out of it. I'm going to stay out here. You know, he didn't glide into some perfect ranch with a beautiful picket fence and enjoyed everything that was neatly mowed around the place. No, he came into the filth. As God entered this world from a screaming, sweating woman's body, he came into our mess. You know, like in our cabin shed, you know, manure can be scraped away and things can be cleaned up. But sometimes the damage that is done that we do to each other can be a little bit harder to take care of. Francis Spoofa described in his, in his book, Unapologetic, our active in inclination to break stuff, stuff hereby including promises, relationships we care about, of, we care about and our own well-being and others' people. Like our daily lives, God was saying, your mess is my mess. You needed me, so I came all the way into this. Now, he didn't just come here to be with us, but to help us clean up our mess, to take care of our sins by offering himself as a sacrifice on the cross for us, to take our filth so that we can be in right standing with God. Maybe you feel distant from God. Maybe you think God only likes clean people, or God only wants to work with the people who got their, their act together. Well, allow me to introduce you to God in the mess, the God who relates to every rank bit of it, or as he called himself, God with us. 
as we, to, as we come to this time of communion, lean in and talk to him. You know, when God sent his son here, it was a perfect gift for us to be born in a manger. He came here because he wanted to have a relationship with us. He doesn't necessarily want to know all of our good stuff, but he came here to help fix where we had corrections, where we had problems that only he can take care of. And then by sending his son to die on the cross for us so that those sins can be washed away and cleaned up for good. There's only been one person able to do that, and that's Jesus Christ himself. We've been given a perfect gift this Christmas. Let's enjoy it. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you very much for the wonderful gift that we have received here. The gift that has been freely given. And Lord, I pray that as, as we take these emblems, we're mind, mindful of the sacrifice that was done on our behalf. And like with any gift that is given, it does have to be received. So Lord, I pray that each one of us here will have our hearts open to him, to hear his word, and invite him in to have a relationship with us. Lord, he loves us. We know you love us where we're at. And you're willing to help be part of any mess that we're in. And you want to see us through it. So Lord, we just pray that we can just turn to you in this time. And thank you for your sacrifice on the cross for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Will you guys join me in uh, prayer over the tithes and offerings? Heavenly Father, Lord, we just uh, we come to you this morning humbled, um, Lord, that uh, you'd be willing to sacrifice so much for us, and, and Lord, so at this time, we just ask that you, uh, that you place that on our hearts uh, to remember that during this time. Uh, Lord, that uh, during this time, we just uh, give back just a portion of what you've blessed us with um, and forget about uh, all, all the other things in this world and, and just to trust in you. And uh, Lord, we just ask that you bless the giver and uh, that uh, all that's given be used to further your kingdom. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. couple of quick announcements before we get started here. Uh, if you were not here last night at the Christmas Eve uh, service, uh, we have, if you're a, a child or you act like a child, we have some candy canes left over. Uh, so uh, on your way out, make sure if you go this way, get one of those. If you're an adult and you didn't get something, we have some uh, little uh, calendars for the new year. Uh, make sure you get one of those. And there's a little bit of candy in there for you as well. Um, also, uh, we want to encourage you to do the uh, reading plan. Uh, so we have a couple different reading plans for the new year to read through the Bible with us. We'd love for you to do that. Take one of those as well. Um, <laughs> uh, as soon as service is over, we are headed to my mother or my in-law's house. I'm working on it. Is it working? Okay. I'm glad to go. And so we're headed that way as soon as church is over. We'll be down there, and Justin is going to uh, his in-laws as well. He all of a sudden got sick this morning. I should have thought of that. Um, but, uh, so, but they're headed out tomorrow. Um, so Garrett Rowland is in charge, the connections coordinator. And my son Jarrett, he is now depressed on Christmas. He has discovered, of all things today, they're starting grief share January 15th on his birthday and I'm like that's not a coincidence son and I'm signed up to go so uh, but uh, anyway so uh, uh, be, have those things in your mind today is Christmas I want to thank you for being here with your family today on Christmas 
what is amazing about Christmas, Christmas is a holiday that Christians all over the world is celebrating. And it's a holiday that, that has different traditions, not only different traditions all over the world, but even different traditions in even different parts of America. Uh, some of you even have different traditions in your home. Uh, one of the traditions that we, we have, uh, the gifts do not come out until sometime in the night. Uh, we get up Christmas morning and we read one of the passages about the Christmas story even before we open the gifts. And the one passage we read today uh, was the very, very familiar Christmas passage of Christmas of Revelation chapter 12. How many of you ever read that Christmas passage? How many of you know what I'm talking about? All right. How many of you going to know when, once we're done today what I'm talking about? All right. Don't leave. Don't get mad. Okay. Get mad when we're done. Um, but there's all kinds of different traditions. Here is something else. Non-believers do Christian traditions and they don't even know they're doing it. This is a perfect time for us to engage in the world and to share with them the gospel message. What a perfect time to share Jesus with the world, to tell them, hey, do you know why you put up an evergreen tree? Do you know why you put lights on the tree? Do you know why we have a candy cane? Do you know why we do all these things that we are doing? Do you know why that at one time in all the world, one day, that Jesus shouts, I want your attention. It's amazing that even every year, did Je was Jesus born December 25th? No, probably not. But every year, he still grabs the world's attention. What an amazing God. That every year we have an opportunity. Every year some magazine is going to write an article. Some way, did Jesus really exist? Was he really God? Did he claim to be God? Some, somebody is going to write an article, and now you're going to see it all over uh, news media, all over your computer, all over Facebook. Somebody is going to draw attention to this Jesus who we serve. We celebrate Christmas as Christians. We give gifts because of the indescribable gift that we have received. We celebrate Christmas by stringing lights because of the light of the world came into existence. We celebrate Christmas by singing carols and singing the great songs because of the joy that he brought into the world. We celebrate Christmas and we decorate the evergreen tree because of the everlasting life that only came in because of Jesus Christ, only could be given by Jesus Christ. We put stars and angels on the tree because of the angels and the stars that shone that night. We celebrate Christmas because of the love that only could come from the God who the Bible says is love. We celebrate Christmas because only God could fix the mess that we made. How many of you remember 1987 baby Jessica? Who made a mistake, a very simple mistake, and fell into a well? And when she fell into the well, for over 58 hours, the rescuers worked and worked and worked trying to save her life. Anybody remember that? You've got to have either no hair, gray hair, or dyed your hair to remember that. <laughs> and the whole world was glued to the TV, hoping and praying that we could save her. One person in all humanity made a simple mistake. Probably was warned by her parents, hey, don't go over there, that's dangerous. An eight-inch well fell in, and rescuers, 50-plus hours trying to save her. But God looked down on man all the way back into Genesis chapter 3. And had a plan set in motion from the beginning from two people. And put a plan into motion 
from Genesis chapter 3 and says, The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be open and you will know good and evil. And from that point on, God says, I've got to put a plan into motion. And that plan into motion was I've got to send myself into human form. And only I can save the mess that they've made. Because the law of death. You see, it wasn't just the fact that all of a sudden they knew evil. But you know, even in the New Testament as Christians, Romans 16, 19, I think we as Christians know too much. Because weren't we commanded by Paul to be innocent of what is evil and to be excellent in what is good? Do we know too much of what we shouldn't know? You know, we all got a lot of useless information. The law of death entered in, and, and what that actually means is we were made incorruptible, we were made perfect, but because the law of death, we are now no longer made in the image of God, which we are made in the image of God, but this incorruptible being that we were supposed to be now has been tainted, and the, the more life goes on and the more human that we are, the, the more time elapses, corruption sits in. And sin sets in, and what's supposed to be perfect over the period of time becomes more corrupted and, and more distasteful. And, and you can see even today that, that humanity is moving further and further away from what we were designed to be. The perfect being, we were to mirror God himself. And we no longer mirror what we were created to be, and that is the law of death. Saint Athanasius says this in his incarnation of the world, the human race was in the process of total destruction. Man who is created in God's image is in the process of reason reflected. The very word himself was disappearing and the work of God was being undone. The law of death, which followed its transgressions, prevailed upon us, and from it there was no escape. Total destruction. You see, when we look at the word, it says God is truth. And as we look up next to him, we're far from truth. We were supposed to be perfect. And we're coming closer to being beasts. What can save us? And Romans chapter 5 says at just the right time, God entered the picture. God in the form of a baby. But why a baby? He's God. Why didn't God, as soon as Adam and Eve made a mistake, why didn't he, chapter 3, chapter 4, the next chapter, God shows up, I'll fix it. Why did it take him 4,000 years? I, I want to get the t-shirt that says, honey, when you ask me to do something, I'll get it done. You don't have to remind me for six months. And all the ladies said, right. Why did it take God 4,000 years to fix it? Because God is so overpowering. Because God is so overwhelming. Because man was not ready nor prepared for God to enter in to our realm. And it took us that time for him to prepare us for an understanding of what it took to save us. Why did it take 4,000 years? Because we weren't ready for what it was going to take to save us. Why did it take 4,000 years? Because mankind could not comprehend what they undid in the fall of man. And at just the right time, and you can go through history and see that the Roman roads were built and, and humankind was ready at that time, and Jesus enters the picture. Why a baby? Well, let's look into Matthew chapter 1. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, 
She was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. That's important. And Joseph, her husband, being of a righteous man, that's important. And not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, that's important, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for this child who is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, that's important, and shall give his name Jesus, that's important, and shall he save his people from their sins, and he shall take this place to fulfill what was spoken of by the Lord of the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translates and the meaning is God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife and kept her as a virgin until she gave birth to a son and called his name Jesus. So why a baby? Well, number one, to fulfill prophecy. Jesus himself over in the Old Testament so that they could be without any doubt that this was the promised one. Now, if somebody just showed up and said, I am the promised one, there could be all kinds of doubts. But to make sure we're going to throw down some prophecies and for thousands of years, we're going to make sure that this is the right one. And to make sure to make sure, we're going to start as a baby. And in this passage alone, there was five prophecies. And he fulfilled five. You go over to the book of Luke and he fulfills more. Even as a baby, he starts off right. There is no way that you're going to doubt that this was the right one. He's the right one. Uh, our Jeep broke down and I had to repair it. And I had to get the right part. These cars are so complex now that you've got to give them your VIN number to get the right parts. I like the old days when you owned a Ford or a Lincoln the parts interchanged. And if you had a file or a grinder, you could interchange them with other vehicles. Nowadays, they're so precise, we need your VIN number to make sure we get the right part. That's precision. That's not even precision as Jesus was or God was with the prophecies. There was no doubt from start to finish because he came as a baby. You're not going to doubt this was the right one. Because humanity needed him to understand. Our Messiah came as a baby from start to finish. He gets you. He gets all the transitions of life. You have a deity, you have a Savior who understands. Moms, men may not understand everything you're going through. But Hebrews chapter 2 says, we have a God who understands. You have a high priest. I'll be, I, don't, I can't explain that to you. But we had a Savior who came into this world who says, and I, the Bible says it, so I've got to believe it, who promises he understands everything. You've lost somebody. Somewhere along the line... Jesus lost his dad. He understands loss. On the night he was betrayed, he went over to his closest friends and he wanted them to get support. I need, if I, I gotta be able to count on these three. His own family mocked him. If you can't count on family, who can you count on? They thought he was crazy. At one point, his own mother thought he was crazy. Jesus gets you. Why did he come as a baby? Because we have a Savior. Humanity needed someone who understands everything about me. We needed God in the flesh. He came in this form because he was God, Emmanuel, God with us. Have you ever been around somebody famous and didn't know it? Have you ever noticed that famous people look different up close? That they don't look the same. 
How many times had somebody been around Jesus and later on they had to be told, you were around Jesus. How many times did their own apostles, and it said after he arose, then they finally got it. I wonder if they would have fully comprehended who they were around if they would have asked different questions. If they would have understood beforehand. Why come as a baby? Because he was deity. The only way deity could have entered into our realm was through a baby. He was the king of kings and the lord of lords. And he conquered death. The only person to be able to conquer sin and death was God himself. And he did that. Because of availability. As a baby... He's telling us that salvation is available to everyone. He come to the shepherds. The shepherds. Salvation isn't exempt for nobody. Anybody. Everybody. Who calls on the name of the Lord. Can be saved. You think of the worst hardened criminal. You think of the most gruesome person you can think of that you would not associate with. And Jesus says, if they turn to me, I'll forgive them. No matter what they've done, if they will turn their sin over to me, their life over to me, I will wash them whiter than snow. Because of ministry. I don't care what you've been asked to do or you, who you've been asked to forgive. You can never be asked to forgive or you can never be asked to do anything lower than what Jesus Christ was asked to forgive or asked to do. On the night he was going to the cross, he washed his disciples' feet. On the cross, The ones that ridiculed him and spit on him. The ones that by night dragged him in front of an illegal tribunal. The ones that took the whip and put it into his back. He said, Father, forgive them. He said that. So no matter what anyone has done to you or what you feel like they've done to you, we have eyewitness account from Jesus himself that he is telling us we have his example that we must go and forgive them no matter what. When you look into the manger, when you look into the eyes of an innocent little baby, what do you see? Besides innocence, I surely don't see anything to worship, do you? In the book of Luke, you can go home and and read this for yourself. The shepherds, two different groups of people, and this encompasses everybody. You have the wise men, a couple years later, come and worship, and, and they bow down before him and worship. And you have the shepherds who come and worship. And they bow down and worship. And the townspeople are scratching their heads. So take another close look at the manger. And who do you see? You see life. There's something precious about the life of a baby. In this manger, what you see is life. Supernatural life that come to earth and and you see sacrificial life God humbled himself to become a baby you see liberty freedom freedom finally from sin's control Romans 6 16 16 says that do you not know that when you present yourselves to to uh, sin you present yourselves to slave to be obedient to that sin 
John 8, 34 clearly says that whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. Romans 3, 23 says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 says for the wages of sin is death. But thanks be to God that, that we have a free gift in Jesus Christ. That in the baby, in the manger, we see that, that we have freedom from sin. We have men's and women's encounter and we wear a bracelet. And it says freedom. One of the things that we proclaim through women's and men's encounters is freedom. I'm glad that our community has Celebrate Recovery. I'm glad that we also have another one that we do here with, with Kevin, that we want people to know the heart of it. anything. We are preaching freedom for whatever you have. We, we preach freedom here. That our, our thing here is, is that we're going to be chain breakers. Well, how do we have that power? It's not by our power. It's by the power that Jesus is willing to come into our mass as a baby. And he paid the price on a cross. You see, love, 1 Corinthians 13 talks about agape love, Un unlimited, unlimited love. No matter what we have done, it's unlimited. For God so loved the world, the world that, that is a terrible mess, God loves that world. 1 Corinthians 13 explains how we're to love each other. It says that he loved us first. It's unmerited. It's unconditional. You see, grace. There we go. I need a new gadget. I looked up the word grace in the Old Testament. The word for grace is one word. It's, it's C-H-E-N-E. -E. It's either pronounced hen or, or ken. It's however you, if you're a redneck in your Hebrew or if you're a city slicker in your Hebrew. And, and actually, it's in there 33 times in the Old Testament. It's only translated 11 times grace. The other times it's translated favor. That Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. In, in um in uh, Psalms 84, it's translated grace, and sometimes it's the idea that God has bestowed, or, and the idea is that God give it. In Jesus, what we're seeing is God giving us grace. It's only 11 times in the Old Testament pronounced grace. Why is that? Because Jesus wasn't in the Old Testament. It's found 120 times in the New Testament, the word grace. And you know what it's translated in the New Testament each time? Grace. Because grace comes in Jesus. Grace has to be given, but for it to work, it's got to be accepted. In the manger, we see grace. So what did the shepherds do when they saw that? They worshipped. When you find Jesus, you can't help but worship. When you finally get freedom, you can't help but worship. What else do you see is surrender. You have to bow down. And then they had service. So what's your response to the manger? Every time at Christmas, I think back to my home. It wasn't much of a house. Never had a roof on it. It was, it was always tore up. We always got our toys, really, except for one toy that I've got. I still have it. It's a Western Auto Semi. It's in our basement. My aunt bought it for me. It's got to be... 30 plus years old I, well now that I'm turning 50 years old it's probably 45 years old all the decals are pulled off of it I couldn't wait to get home to open that and how I played and played with that one toy my aunt never had any kids she never got married I was kind of her adopted son and I loved that one toy. Loved it so much I still kept it. 
And I don't know if my kids will ever get that one. Well, I've got some guns I'm going to hand down to them. But I'm probably not going to give that one away. It's just a stupid semi. But every other present that I was given, the police would show up with a trash bag full of used toys. Somebody else's junk. But that one, my aunt knew that I wanted. And she gave it to me. I'm the youngest of seven, not to my sisters. Who likes them anyway? They're me. Not to my brother. That one was given to me. Somehow, God gave the world Jesus, but he's done it personally. Isn't that amazing? That to each and every one of us, grace has been given. Personally. As if it's just to you. Now, I told you Revelation 12 is a Christmas story. It's a neat story. And when you do your nativity scene, you're forgetting one person. Oh, you have the wise men and you have the shepherds and you have the animals, you have Joseph and Mary and you have Jesus, but you're forgetting the arch enemy. You see, you, you do the pretty part. See, Revelation talks about how that Satan hated the whole story. And from start to finish, he was fighting it the whole way. Oh, we see it in Matthew and Luke to where over here we see that they had to run and flee. They had to run and flee. They had to run and flee. In Revelation 12, we see the spiritual side of that. For the dragon tried to destroy it. But he was not powerful enough to stop what God ordained. And all the way through there, you see this war going on. And even today, we see a war against God's people. But if you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you have that all-encompassing power inside of you. And that grace, somehow, God personally bestows it upon you. Unmerited favor. And he pulls you to the side personally sometime and says, hey, come here. I got a gift I want you to have. And you unwrap it. Because the best I can say about this world, man, it's, it, it's horrible. It's tough. But God pulls you to the side and says, stick with me, I'll get you through it. Because I have come so that you may have joy. Joy. Life. But the only way you're going to make it through this life is with my grace. And he told Paul, my grace is sufficient. And if you're trying to make it without that grace, you're not going to make it very far. Maybe someday when you turn hundreds of years old, you've been in faith for a while, somebody's going to ask you, how did you make it through all those years? Well, the special gift you give me. That's how I made it. When you look in the manger, what's your response to what God has given you? In order for grace to work, he's given it to you, but you got to receive it. What's your response as we stand and sing? <clears throat>
on your way out, grab somebody's hand and tell them how good they look on July 4th. I mean on Christmas, on Christmas. All right. You got another song for us? All right. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Fourth of Easter. Amen. 